Welcome to Vulnerabilities 1001. I'm Zeno Kovo. And I'm Casey Dunsey. And we're going to learn about C software implementation vulnerabilities. But what does it mean to be vulnerable? Well, Webster's Dictionary defines vulnerable as capable of being physically or emotionally wounded. So yes, we want to make sure in this class that your code is neither physically nor emotionally wounded. Indeed, we will learn to build brick walls around your vulnerable heart of your code. Let's talk about the class scope. This class is specifically about implementation vulnerabilities. We don't cover design vulnerabilities or logic bugs. So we're going to be focusing on implementation flaws as written into code, written in C, C++, or Objective-C, and specifically the type of flaws that lead to attacker-controlled memory corruption, either directly, as is the case for things like stack overflows and heap overflows, or indirectly, as is the case for things like integer overflows or other integer issues that can re-lead to stack overflows and heap overflows. This memory corruption is what is ultimately exploited in order to give the attacker full control of the system, typically via arbitrary code execution. But I want to be clear that exploitation of the vulnerabilities is generally out of scope for this class. We will at times walk through particular vulnerabilities and describe exactly how they could be exploited, but the purpose here is just to provide a little bit of credibility to our statements that exploit engineering is just a type of engineering, and consequently, when we say that particular vulnerability types could be exploitable, you will see concretely how that could be achieved. It's not always clear whether or not a vulnerability is actually an exploitable vulnerability. But once you see the complexity to which people will go in order to exploit vulnerabilities, you'll get a better sense of why you can't just take things at face value and say, oh, that seems hard, I don't see how anyone can exploit that. Because very often, through a lot of jumping through hoops, they can exploit it, and we'll show you exactly some ways that that's done. So why does this class matter? Why does anyone need to know about these vulnerabilities? The reason I think it matters when there are vulnerabilities in people's code is that real people get harmed. It could either be directly, as is the case when their specific computer gets infected and they specifically lose some money, could be also that, you know, they're a business owner, a small business owner, you know, they're going to be affected just as much as an individual or possibly more because, you know, their entire livelihood could be destroyed if ultimately their company is exploited. Maybe they don't have, you know, actual IT support or anything like that. And consequently, they lose a bunch of money and they go out of business. It can also indirectly affect people when, for instance, the company they work for is exploited leading to losses, which can lead to job losses for people. Could also be indirectly by way of exploitation of local state or federal governments, national governments. Uh, and, you know, of course, any sort of loss of money when, you know, things are stolen from a state or local government ultimately is stealing directly from the tax revenue. And the closer you get to local government, obviously, if they lose a couple millions of dollars, that's that many less miles of roads that get paved or library books that got bought and everything else. And there's also the indirection of when things like critical infrastructure get attacked. And you know, a software developer might not think that their particular code ultimately is going to wind up in critical infrastructure, but one never knows. And so, you know, when water treatment plants go down or the electrical grid goes down, obviously that hurts real people. Now, I want to be clear that when we talk about possible attackers, it could be broader than what you typically think about. It can, of course, start from the traditional script kitty, which in the security industry refers to someone who doesn't really know how the attack tools work, but somehow they've gotten their hands on attack tools and they just run the scripts and they successfully exploit systems. You could also imagine that the attacker could be a spouse or a significant other of the victim or a family member. Certainly throughout history, family feuds have had a possibility of echoing down through the generations. And now the opportunity to lash out at those family members you don't like via computer means, well, you know, if they think they can do it and they think they can get away with it, then they might do it. Now, of course, often people think about criminals, whether organized or otherwise. Now, of course, criminals can start from the small time individual or it can ultimately work up to highly coordinated groups of, you know, dozens or hundreds of people all working towards a common goal of making that money. 
Companies too can be attackers that need consideration, whether it's because a company is, for instance, compelled by a government to perform some action, or it could just be that, you know, you have corporation on corporation espionage and attacks. Furthermore, attacks could come from within the company via insiders or malicious individuals where, you know, maybe it's not the company policy to backdoor some particular person, but a well-placed insider could still achieve that. And then, of course, there's always governments, both foreign and domestic. You might be worried about some other government hacking you. You might be worried about your own government hacking you. It all really just depends upon your placement and what your threats are. And so I want to be clear that, you know, these are just some potential attackers. I also want to be clear that there are many other types of attacks that we don't cover in this class. There's the things like distributed denial of service, social engineering, web application, eavesdropping, cyber physical attacks. There's all sorts of things that are not this class. In this class, we focus very narrowly on memory corruption vulnerabilities leading to arbitrary attacker code execution. So now drilling down on that specific type of attack, we can know that there's particular types of vulnerabilities within this memory corruption subspecies. And I really like this data from Microsoft where they've tracked over time what type, what subtypes of vulnerabilities have actually been seen and reported to them. So drilling down into this one specific type of attack, I like looking at this data from Microsoft where they specifically tracked from 2006 forward, what's, what types of vulnerabilities did they actually see amongst the vulnerabilities that were actually disclosed to them? So the way to read this chart is that the bottom color is stack corruption, the next color is heap corruption, the next color is use after free, type confusion, uninitialized, use heap, out of bound read, and other. So you can see that like over time, the 100% adds up to different numbers. So here it's 39 plus 164, 10, 37, 31. So, you know, somewhere around, let's call it 150 or so. Whereas in 2019, we can see it's 11, 130, 98, 81, 40, 94, 216. So quite a few more vulnerabilities over time. You can also see that the breakdown as a percentage varies over time. So whereas there were more stack overflows back here, the stack overflows kind of decreased to almost nothing over time. You can see that there was a big batch of what looks like use after free vulnerabilities circa 2014. And so the composition of things changes over time, the total number changes over time. But the key point is that these are exactly the types of vulnerabilities that you will learn about either in this class or in the next 1002 class. So it says that the you know, top vulnerability classes were heap out of bounds. Well, we learn about that in this class. Use after free, that's next class, unfortunately, as is type confusion and uninitialized data use. But the point is you have to walk before you can run. And so the types of vulnerabilities covered in this class are the simpler ones. And when you ultimately get to these, they'll make a whole lot more sense because you understand the vulnerabilities we cover in this class. Ultimately, the way things very often go is that the newer and more sophisticated types of attacks are really just trying to reopen and unlock the earlier types of attacks that attackers are more comfortable with. Now, this class is being structured in a particular way for a particular purpose. So we are learning in this class specifically about vulnerabilities, not exploitation, like I said. So for some people in this class, you might be a developer, and the goal here is to learn vulnerabilities in order to avoid writing the vulnerabilities so that you can do secure development. For other students in this class, you might be here to learn about vulnerabilities so that you can learn about vulnerability exploitation in future classes. So the point is, I want both such students to know that the other student is there. If you're a developer, I want you to know I'm teaching vulnerabilities to people who want to go exploit the vulnerabilities. And therefore, you know, you should really take these lessons uh, to heart because if you don't, then, well, the people know how to exploit those vulnerabilities for the future. Vulnerability exploitation engineers, I want you to know that there's developers in this class as well. And if those developers do their jobs right, then they're just going to put the right sanity checks in place and you're going to have a hard time. So whose side am I on anyways here? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm on the developer side. So I don't like the fact that my computer can be exploited and that I can be victimized. So I really want people to write secure software. But I know that, you know, vulnerability exploitation is a big component of what leads to secure software. So I'm happy to 
know, help teach people to find the vulnerabilities. And in the future, you'll have people to teach you how to exploit the vulnerabilities. Now let's talk about my favorite subject of the class, acid. Now, me American, no like, speak, lot, syllables, bleh. So there's a bunch of different ways that we can refer to, for instance, attacker controlled input or tainted data, but those are far, far, far too many syllables for me to say on a regular basis. So let's go ahead and rearrange it into attacker controlled input data, and thus we can abbreviate it as ACID. ACID, two syllables, perfect, exactly what I want. So the thing you need to know about ACID is that ACID burns. Just asked famed hacker Kate Libby, aka Acid Burn from Hackers 1995. Acid flows through a program and corrupts everything that it touches, catching it on fire. And so if you're a developer, your job is to neutralize, sanitize, or otherwise stop the vulnerabilities that are incurred by the flow of acid. And if you're a attacker, well, your job is to hack the planet using the acid, of course. And A is for acid. So very frequently in examples, both in this class and when you do your related work reading outside of class, you will see magic numbers like 41, 41, 41 occur a lot. Well, I just want you to know for background purposes that the reason why you see things like 41, 41, 41 is that they are trying to indicate something as acid, that is attacker controlled input data. This convention comes from the first article to really explain to people how to exploit stack buffer overflows, uh, smashing the stack for fun and profit from ALF1, 1996. And in that article, he described, you know, how you could have, for instance, a large string. This is a uh, stack buffer and it's 256 bytes. And then he copied a whole bunch of A's into that large string. And so ultimately, if you copy too many A's into that string, you will overflow that buffer with A's, which are hex character 41. And consequently, you would corrupt the instruction pointer on a x86 system, on an Intel system. And all of a sudden, then the program would seemingly return to a magic address 41, 41, 41. So again, I think this is just helpful to know that if you are a developer and someone's sending you a proof of concept exploit and they're, for instance, showing, hey, look, I set all of these registers to 41, 41, 41. They're trying to tell you that this is now attacker controlled. And if you're someone who's sending in a proof of concept exploit for a vulnerability you just found, you should use something like 41, 41, 41 to tell those developers that it's attacker controlled. The next term we would like to discuss is shellcode. Shellcode was originally meant to be the code that spawned being SH at the conclusion of an exploit. Now it's meant to mean any arbitrary code to be executed by the exploited program by the exploit. The term originally stemmed from smashing the stack paper by LF1, which was briefly described by Zeno in the previous slide. Next up is exploit primitive. And above the, the title of the slide, we have a primate illustrating a local exploit and another primate illustrating a remote exploit. But what is an exploit primitive? This is a fundamental capability that is useful during exploitation. So you see, as an attacker, you typically have an objective in the end, maybe achieve remote code ex execution or some level of control at, at some point. Um, but due to the complexity of modern day technology and the mitigations in place, these are not easily achievable. What you have instead is tiny, tiny milestones, which unlock the new capabilities for you, which when chained together, as we'll discuss in the future, enable you to have the type of access you are intending to achieve. For example, an exploit primitive could be ability to write overwrite of adjacent data with ACID. It could also mean the ability to write semi-attacker controlled data with, to an arbitrary location or write completely attacker controlled data to an arbitrary location. This particular one does have a no, well-known term called the write what where primitive. Additionally, these, there are information disclosure primitives which basically allow you or give you the capability to read or have access to data or information that would have been previously unknown to you um, 
as an exploit writer. So what is an exploit chain? An exploit chain involves putting together these multiple exploit primitives to achieve the ultimate goal. When attacking a weak, weak target, an exploit chain may require a single bug, which provides all the necessary primitives. So maybe it's from the nature of the bug, you really only needed one primitive. However, most hardened targets in modern technology require multiple bugs that unlock multiple primitives, which would then, which when chained together would help achieve the ultimate goal. It is therefore critical to close even seemingly non-exploitable vulnerabilities because this could typically be somewhat leveraged at some point by an attacker for a much larger goal. And so again, we, we just want to re-emphasize that we want to ax the bugs. Uh, this is a bit of my favorite one to clarify. If you've been paying attention to the industry, the word zero, zero day is always so casually thrown around. Every researcher publishing a CVE or wanting to bring attention to their vulnerability disclosure tags it with the term zero day. And what this essentially does, it, it shrieks panic across the entire industry. But actually, zero day means that there were zero days between the public disclosure slash discovery of this vulnerability and exploitation in the wild. The key term there being exploitation in the wild. So technically, if the vulnerability is not yet exploited in the wild before the disclosure, then it's not a zero day. So just discovering a vulnerability and talking about it in your disclosure does not warrant it becoming a zero day. An end day, on the other hand, implies that there are end days between public disclosure of the vulnerability and exploitation in the wild. So now the general public, for lack of a better word, is aware of the vulnerability um, and now an exploit is somewhere lurking in the wild after the disclosure. So the end day stands for the number of days between that disclosure and the first exploit in the wild. The objective for an attacker and dare I say more than the defenders is to drive N down to less than one because from an attacker point of view, if you could pick a disclosure and turn it into an exploit before the defenders or affected components deploy patches, then you would still be able to leverage it as much as you could, almost similar to the way you would have done if it were zero day. From a defender's point of view, whilst you might be in a harsh to patch, there might not be capabilities to actually implement the patches as soon as possible. So being able to understand the full scope of what an exploit could be and implementing instead um, detections for those patches could be of greater good to the public. One days are typically created via patch analysis. And in this particular process, um, a researcher takes the patched code and the unpatched code and determines what kind of fix was applied. Let's discuss on being vulnerable. I want you to picture some code, and this could be something written by you or could be written by me. This code has what we like to refer to as an attack surface. An attack surface is essentially parts of the code that will be expected to process attacker controlled impute data. Now, it is the duty of the developer to understand how data will be fed into the program and apply proper sanitization and validation to ensure that the program handles or impute data correctly and does not allow or yield control over to an arbitrary actor. So we have enlisted a few of these potential attack surfaces, but this list is by no means exhaustive. Your program could be expecting user input in the form of strings or commands, or it could be file systems. And here we're not just referring to the actual files, you're referring to, referring to the data structures that are relevant to those file systems. So if you're an ext4, fat32, whatnot developer, um, you would pot potentially be parsing data structures relevant to these kinds of file systems. And, and if they are controlled by an attacker, then you have attacker controlled impute data. There is also the actual files like PDFs, image documents, which are very complex in specification and usually are very heavy locations for um, vulnerabilities to reside. 
There is also spe special persistent storage, which would include any storage whereby the attacker writes some sort of inputs in there and then the target code eventually reads from that location. So it could be databases, the Windows registry, and UFI non-volatile variables if we're you know, dealing with embedded systems. Attacker controlled input could also come from pipes, shared memory for interactions between the user space and kernel space, debugging interfaces, direct memory access, hyper calls if you're a hypervisor or system calls if you're an operating system, inter-process process communications if you're a user space application, exported APIs which by default are expecting to receive some sort of um, attacker controlled parameters so you want to be doing a lot of validation and sanitization on those inputs before any further processing. Network data, and this is a, this is a huge one. Whether you're referring to low-level applications or low-level packets, uh, sorry, or um, application-level code such as HTTP, these are almost often completely attacker-controlled. So a lot of care must be taken when processing these sorts of inputs. There is also the case when data comes in from things like peripherals, such as USB devices attached to a main processor. So again, that kind of de basically just depends on what kind of application you're trying to uh, create. But essentially, whenever an input is received from a code base that is not, from a source that is not part of the code base, such an input should be treated as a potential attacker controlled input data. Now I want to talk to you about the sploity sense. The sploity sense is like Spider-Man's spidey sense. Spider-Man's spidey sense senses danger, sort of supernaturally senses danger. Now, vulnerability hunters over time, from having looked at many, many, many different examples of vulnerabilities, develop sort of a sixth sense, a sploity sense, an exploity sense, whether or not something is exploitable. Their sploity sense ultimately is a recognition of danger in the code, Things like attacker-controlled inputs not being sanitized, things like arbitrary-sized copies and stuff like that. And ultimately, this sploity sense is really just pattern recognition. It's this, this tingle in the back of your head that says, you know, if I see fragmentation and reassembly, I know that there's been a whole lot of fragmentation and reassembly vulnerabilities over the years. If I see a lack of sanity checks, I know that those very often lead to exploitable vulnerabilities. So, you know, you too can learn how to develop a sploity sense because at the end of the day, this supernatural sixth sense is really just pattern recognition developed by looking at lots of examples. And so that's kind of the fundamental reason why this class is built around examples because we could give you a whole bunch of different artificial examples and, you know, yes, those would teach you the, the core of things, but the way that actual vulnerability hunters find things in the wild is they just read a whole lot of write-ups. I mean, yes, some of them, you know, practice their skills and things like capture the flag events, CTFs. But, you know, to be a really, truly good professional vulnerability hunter, you have to know, like, what has been found in the past and then be able to sort of recognize when you're re-seeing the same sort of problems over and over or, you know, in the extreme cases of extremely good vulnerability hunters, you have to be able to see completely new things that nobody has ever seen before. But for the rest of us who are not, you know, the top, top, top 0.0001%, a good pattern recognition sense is good enough to get you a whole bunch of vulnerabilities. So I just want to start priming your sploity sense right now by teaching you a few words of power, words of destruction. These are words that when you see them in the context of code, it should absolutely set the hairs on the back of your neck, your sploity sense of tingling, because they very often are related to vulnerabilities. So for instance, you could have parsing. Parsing could have to do with parsing complicated data structure formats like images or XML or office documents, file systems or packets. And so parsing absolutely has led to so many vulnerabilities over time. Then you can have things like decoding, where basically some sort of data has been encoded into a particular data structure format, it needs to be decoded back out to a different format. You can have conversion, similar to that idea of you know, decoding, encoding, converting between different formats can absolutely lead to vulnerabilities, as can deserialization. Again, it's just this idea of 
data in that is serialized, converted into some sort of format, and when you deserialize it, it leads to vulnerability. So, you know, in some sense, some of these are, you know, just pure synonyms, but that's the point, is that a developer may call things by any of these different names, but at the end of the day, they are going to be the kind of things that lead to vulnerabilities, as you'll see throughout the rest of the class. You can also have things like interpret, where again, some sort of input is being interpreted and it is fully attacker controlled input, so consequently, things can go awry. And also, you could have something like decompression. This one will often lead to a situation where a small amount of data gets expanded up to a big amount of data, and that can lead to the sort of buffer overflows that we'll learn about in the next sections. So now let's see if I can remember the names of all these different languages. Okay, we've got uh, Dragon Tongue from Skyrim. We've got Klingon from Star Trek. We've got Arabesh from Star Wars. We've got Krakoan from X-Men. We've got Angerthos, Moria from Lord of the Rings. And we've got Old Tongue from Wheel of Time. All right, figured it out, good. I'll be honest though, you know, this was actually all just an excuse to add this in because, you know, I waited a good decade or so and I only just started playing Skyrim very recently. But I really dug its, you know, faux cuneiform uh, type of writing. Okay, now our final words of wisdom from this introduction before we move on to learning about the vulnerabilities. Program paranoid, because it's not really paranoia if they're out to get you. If you're a developer in this class, you're going to learn all sorts of interesting ways that an attacker can exploit your program, and you'll learn why it's extremely important to, you know, sanitize, neutralize, and otherwise stop those attacker-controlled inputs. The only way to do that is if you are programming paranoid. You're thinking specifically, this is acid coming into my program. I need to be careful with it. I'm going to get burned if I don't. And so, program paranoid.